Thank you, the official audio ROM, which I am subscribed to, for the Kai Kai Kaifus Kane original and extended version for this little beautiful meme song, which I have listened to multiple times for no reason in particular. <clears throat> Anyways, on with the story at hand. Chapter 12. Which didn't stop me from trying, of course, but every reason I could come up with to palm the job off on somebody else sounded hollow, even to me. And besides, Forez had been seen to be leading her contingent from the front, so I could hardly appear reluctant to do the same. I just had to go through with it and hope the troopers with me would keep the greenskins off my back. Accordingly, I found myself in the passenger compartments of the antiquated-looking Valkyrie, Barclow's friend, and the local forces had found for us. Battling our way through another of the blizzards so common on the surface of Nesquirim Fundamentalis, the airframe groaned audibly as the seat beneath me lurched, and I checked my chronograph anxiously, hoping that Lizenbard had erred on the side of caution in his estimate of the time left until the power plant vaporized, assuming we arrived at all. Are we nearly there yet? Jürgen asked, his face beneath the habitual patneur of grime, a little paler than usual, and I nodded grimly. We are. I reserved him, gripping the arms of my seat a little more tightly as the Valkyrie hit another crosswind. If the leeward barons were supposed to be the sheltered part of the hemisphere, I shuddered to think what conditions would have been like on the far side of the mountain range. No one of the Nesquians had so few aircraft. Good. Jürgen said, busying himself with the tenth unnecessary inspection of his melter since he'd taken off. Reassured that the power pack was fully charged and the emitters properly aligned, he began numbling something under his breath that might have been the litany of accuracy, but which, knowing him as I did, I strongly suspected to be... A Involuntary, unfounded slender of a pilot's abilities. We have a visual, the pilot informed me, his voice echoing tinly in my comm bead, and I glanced out of the viewport. Grateful that the moment I took my nose as far away as possible from my sight. Take us around, I said, wide and slow. I wanted a good look of the objective before we set foot in it. So far as it was possible to get good look at anything with visibility so drastically obscured by the fleering snow. And be prepared to suppress any sign of resistance. Given their indifference to physical hardship, it was more than likely that there had been orcs on the surface. And if there were any, they were bound to start taking pot shots at us. Then, struck by another thought, I added, Don't use the hell strikes unless you have to. Stick to the multi-laser. Roger that. The pilot responded, not quite managing to conceal his irritation. At being told how to do his job. To be honest, I didn't think the heavy missiles slung under the wings were all likely to spark off the explosions we were here to prevent. But you could never tell. Even if it didn't, I was pretty sure the Adeptus Mechanicus would take a dim view of the precious shrine being knocked about even more badly than the orcs had already managed to do so. But as we continued the circle, no enemy fire rose to challenge us. They must be inside out of the cold, Jürgen said, his air sickness apparently forgotten in the prospect of action so close, carrying his head over for a better look and coming too close to my nose for comfort. Well, warm them up, Margaret said from a seat behind me, and snapped a fresh power cell into her last gun, with every sign of relish. Right, Sarge? Right. Sergeant Griffin nodded. Hair, clipped tones, 
calmly professional. When we hit the deck, secure the ramp. Team one with me, the Kamazar. Team two, follow us inside as soon as the Valkyrie lifts. While we cover you. Got it? You've got it. Magar Suda, visibly pleased to have the first chance to take a crack at the orcs. She and Griffin were close, personally as well as professionally, and could be relied on to anticipate one another's moves in the heat of battle without any discretion. An easy report which had made them my first choice of squad leaders for this assignment. As we sprawled in, however, it looked as though Margot was trying to be disappointed. There were no traces of occupying orcs that could be seen, just as the communication and distribution towers. And the squat bulk of the turbine sanctuary loomed out of the flowing snow like an image on a badly tuned pick caster. The snow-choked landing pad grew our attention to its presence with a ring of flashing lights. A small blockhouse on the periphery providing access to the bulk of the complex, which, like almost everything else, Niskum from the Benedictus, had been hollowed out underground, away from the ferocious conditions of the surface. No obvious signs of damage, were reported. The Vox unit in the cockpit relaying was my words to Isambard, listening in from the warmth and comfort of Pimdeveling and the other squads in the platoon, who were supposed to be in the position around the installation by now to intercept the greenskins, making a break for it, and to come to our aid as fast as their transports could carry them if the barbaric Xenos turned out to be there in greater numbers than we anticipated. The palms of my hands tinkled briefly as I spoke. If the orcs had indeed invaded the complex, there should have been a clear traces of their presence scanning on the walls from the stray stubborn and bolter rounds, which would have been shot off with the usual ambition. At the very least, no vehicles parked either, Jürgen added, his face contorted for a moment with the effort of radio condition. Could they have come on foot? A long way to walk if they did, I said, although given the hardiness of an average orc, that didn't necessarily rule out the possibility. And if they didn't have vehicles, that would have made it a lot easier to slip through our lines undetected. So we'll only have a small group to worry about, Griffin said with the assurance only a Vald Hallen could bring to the discussion of orcish strategy and tactics. The bad news is, if they made it this far undetected, we're up against infiltrators, and good ones at that. We need to keep an eye out for ambushes and booby traps every step of the way. I nodded in agreement. So we go in cautiously, checking uh, for tripwires. I took another look at my iconograph, and wished I hadn't. The time to Isambard's earliest estimate was far shorter than I would have liked, and if we had to waste time pussyfooting around instead of heading straight for the objective, our margin for error was going to be gobbled up rapidly. There was no help for it, though, so I voxed the pilot again. Take us in, I said, hoping for the best, but bracing myself for the worst as usual. We ground in the middle of the pad, the rear loading ramp dropping with a clang on the recto blackened crate, and the cramped passenger compartment suddenly become full of fleering snow. Gritting my teeth against the razor edged wind which billowed with it, I took my place behind Griffin and followed her hurrying from out of the blizzard. Maggot's team had fanned out around the ramp peering over with their las guns at the snow-shrouded hummocks which surrounded the pad, and with for a moment my imagination insisted there were greenskins laying in ambush. Then reason reasserted itself, and I realized there was nothing more threatening than fueling points. Their hoses retracted, waiting for shuttles to arrive with supplies and rotating staff. Which reminded me, 
When we told there were 17 people here when the orcs attacked, I asked. We were, Griffin confirmed, and not one of them got to a vox, which was disturbing, to say the least. However stealthy the orcs had approached it, the installation itself was too big to have been taken in a contracted rush, and most of the cog boys working there would have had several minutes to raise the alarm before following to the Bardos invaders. The greenskins must have moved faster, the sergeant said in response to my vocalized musings, or there were more than we thought. There are always more than you think, Maggot said, cheerfully. Enthusiasm for a target-rich environment as keen as ever. Griffin, a quartet of troopers, Jürgen and I double-teamed it across the bare rockrete, our boot soles splashing in red freezing slush, where the covering of snow had been blown clear or melted by Valkyrie's landing jets and made it into ice of a blockhouse without attracting any incoming fire. Which wasn't all that surprising, as any orc on the surface would have announced their presence by blazing away at the Valkyrie on its final approach. By that point in my career, I found it safest not to take anything for granted. The door's locked, Griffin reported, with an air of surprise. It was true, as a complex of experimental tugs was enough to confirm, and I felt a shiver of unease displacing the one endangered by the bitter cold. The rune pad was intact, with no sign of blast damage that I had experienced from orcs in the past when they tried to make a forced entry. While I was pondering the implications of that, the shriek of Valkyrie engines rose to a pitch which threatened to strip the enamel from my teeth. I glanced back to seeing rising from the ground, like on the troopers hunkering down against the scoldering backwash. Their eyes narrowed. We'll keep circling, the pilot voxed, in case the greens can show themselves. Don't go too far, I cautioned, and the pilot chuckled. We'll be there when you need us. He promised, and disappeared into the murk above our heads, the sound of his engine slowly blending into the unending wind. So how do we open it? Griffin asked, looking at me with a puzzled expression on her face, no doubt as uneasy as I felt. I can get us in, Jürgen said, confidently, raising his melter and siding on the lock. Wait! I raised a hand to forestall him. They might have rigged charges to it. Not a problem if the melter vaporized them before they went off, of course. But very bad news, the thermal shock of near miss made them detonate. I fumbled in a pocket from my data slate with clumsy, cold, numb fingers. The magos gave me the schematic. Maybe the codes are in the map keys. Fortunately, they were. I tapped in the numbers into my revealed surprise. The runes in the pad suddenly changed color from red to green, before being replaced by the words Access Authorized. It worked, I said, replacing the slate, along with an overly generous portion of melting slush in my greatcoat pocket. Leaning against the door as I did so, to my surprise, it suddenly moved, squealing aside on poorly greased runners, sending me staggering to the corridor beyond. Commissar? Griffin said, almost taken aback as I was. I held up the conditioning hand as I recovered my balance. Nothing had blown me up or shot at me, and no axe-wielding greenskin berserkers had come howling out of the darkness. So I might as well look as though I had taken point on purpose. Wait a moment, I said, fumbling and illuminated out of my pocket and flashing it around. Let's just make sure it's safe before anyone else comes in. I seemed to be in a tunnel, which was no surprise, angling gently downwards, wide enough for a pillet loader to trudge along, or for four people to walk in a line, abreast. Luminator controls are usually next to the door, and I got put in helpfully, 
and directing the beam back towards a rectangle of daylight fringed with curious faces. I was able to pick up them out of the little difficulty. There you go, sir, Jürgen said, slapping the activation plate with the heel of his hand. And a line of over illuminators began to flicker on ahead of us, lighting the way down into the heart of the complex. Want me to close it again? Margot asked as she passed through the portal, with the four troopers under her command. Better not, I said. We were as sure as we could be that there were no orcs on the surface ready to follow us down, and my paranoia was always a little less acute for knowing we had fast line our retreat open behind us, especially on this occasion, when if something went wrong we needed to get out before the plant blew up. The Floyd boys pick off any greenskins who get near it anyway. Works for me, Margot agreed, trotting past the take point with her team at her heels. The rest of us followed, ever weary, our boot soles ringing out on the rock creek floor despite our efforts to make us as little noise as possible. We kept our eyes open for ambush or booby traps, checking every shadow but seeing nothing. The absence of any concentrate threat somehow even more disquieting than a change of bellowing orc would have been. At least then we would have known what we were dealing with. Although, of course, I'd really known what we were dealing with. I'd been halfway back to the Valkyrie by now. <laughs> At length, we came to another door blocking the end of the passage. I was about to consult the data slate again when it slid smoothly aside, revealing a neatly whitewashed wall beyond the embezzled with a phrase of miscellaneous machine parts, with no doubt meant something in the iconography of the Adeptus Mechanicus. We instantly raised our weapons, seeking a target, but no one came through, and after a moment we relaxed again, seeing the unmistakable hand of the Amasaya at work. Clearly the machine spirits of the power plant recognized us as friends, and we were working to aid us in a realization we all heartened to us all. Ding! The door rings, <laughs> and the slides open. Clear left, Jupiter Voorhees reported, leveling his last gun down the corridor, while Drere, his indispensable companion, aimed at the opposite direction, the faint click hiss of her augmented lungs echoing eerily in the stillness. Clear right, Deary echoed in a heartbeat later, and the rest of us followed the map on the screen in my hand, leading us ever deeper into the heart of this complex. Still no sign of any change, Griffin murmured, clearly as perturbed by that as I was. Or oh, any of the cog boys, I agreed. Then the greenskin must have killed them all, Magor said, as though that were a foregone conclusion. Unless any took the survivors prisoner, so they can keep the plant operating, I suggested. Orcs commonly enslaved humans who seem to possess skills they can use, although the unfortunate captives seldom lasted long. Why would they do that? Griffin asked, and I shrugged, unable to find an answer. Found something, Voriz reported from further up the tunnel, holding up a hand to check our progress, and glancing down at the floor a few meters ahead of where he stood. Looks like blood. A lot of it. Dergriff agreed, trotting up behind him. They were right, a large splash of it staining the grey rockcrete floor, a rusty brown, around a still tacky center with some stone with a sickly crimson sheen and a light of overhead illuminators. I scanned the wall, seeing no sign of any pockmarks or catering. If someone had been shot here, it had been with precision and accuracy completely foreign to the greenskins. Was it taking them down hand to hand? Griffin said, having come to the same conclusion. Then where's the body? I asked rhetorically. 
orcs would have looted the corpse of their victim and left it where it fell, unless they were hungry, and in that case we'd find a lot less than a pool of blood. Dragged it away? Jurgen suggested as I shook my head. Then there'll be a trail of blood on the floor, I pointed out. The stone was clear-edged, unlongated. Carried it then, my aide said, unperturbed. That was possible, I supposed. An orc would certainly be strong enough to carry a cadaver, but what would it be the point? That seems remarkably tidy for an orc, I said, but Jürgen just nodded in his constitutional immunity to sarcasm, serving him as well as it always did. There are scratches on the door here, Deirdre reported, another handful of meters down the tunnel. The hairs on the back of my neck began to prickle for reasons I couldn't quite articulate. As I squatted down to examine them, some sort of cart, you reckon? Could be, I said. My old underhiver survivor skills let me read the faint pattern of blemishes on the door as easily as sheet of print. A numeral trolleys or carts had been wheeled along the corridor as you have expected in a complex like this. But something about the marks Deere had found looked familiar and different from the rest. Faint, parallel scratches, as though something large with clawed feet had strolled through here not too long ago. Vori spared his fingers spanning the inner and outer scratches, finding his splayed hand fit completely between them. He flexed his fingers thoughtfully and glanced at Dere, the two of them evidently coming to the same conclusion. Do they have ambles on Neskun fundamentalists? he asked, which seemed like a perfectly reasonable question to me. Last time we'd been on the ice world, we'd come across a whole colony of creatures which definitely shouldn't have been there. And if it happened once, it could probably happen again. Dere and Vodis looked at one another, no doubt remembering that it was an amble which had torn half her chest away on Similia. Or Lathe. And that she had been damn lucky to get back to the mining habitatorium fast enough to get the damaged organs replaced. Could be an amble track. I agreed. It hardly seemed likely, but if they wanted to look out for ambles, as well as orcs, that was fine by me. As we moved on, I took final glance at the faint parallel scratches and found Jürgen doing the same. His brow furrowed. Reminds me of something, he said, coughing riskitously and making a spot on the generous deposit of mucus. But I can't think of what. No. Me neither, I said, taking a familiar hold of my chainsword and last pistol. In the years we'd served together, we'd faced so much that it was hardly surprising that some of the details had got blurred along the way. Nevertheless, we both kept our weapons readily at hand, and our progress, when it resumed, was even more cautious than it had been before. We were to find out about a dozen more of these disquieting bloodstains before we reached the heart of the complex, but no other signs of tech priest who was supposed to be manning the place. In a couple instances, the spilled blood had been altered by lubricants and hydraulic fluid, indicating that this was where some of the larger servants had met the same fate as their masters, which sparked another echo of memory since it was subordinately refused to come into focus, however. I merely shrugged and let it go, knowing from experience that the more I tried to force it, the more inclusive the thought would become. From time to time, we came across more of the scratches in the door, doing ever since Vores had raised the matter. I found myself wondering if we ought to be looking for some kind of beast on the loose, as well as the orcs. Perhaps in retrospect, this is why I didn't recognize the true nature of the threat we were facing until almost too late. My mind running along predetermined pathways instead of remaining open to the evidence around me. 
This must be it, I said at last, pausing outside a door which, unlike the others we'd passed through, refused to open at our approach. The temperature had risen steadily as we descended, so that by now I felt quite comfortable, and my Valhannon companions had opened their greatcoats to reveal the body armor beneath them. Clearly wishing we were back on the surface where it was nice and comfortable thirty below. Looks like it, Griffin agreed, scowling at another rune plated locking mechanism. Hang on, I said, squinting at the data slate again. But before I could find the codes I needed, Jurgen simply pushed the door open with his grubby fingertips and poked the barrel of his melter through in search of a target. It's unlocked, he said. Well, it shouldn't be, I said, recalling the installation Zizimbard had given me. The power core and the control chapel are the most sanctified areas in the entire shrine. Access is supposed to be restricted to the utmost devout acolytes. The squad of troopers around me began to look at one another uneasily. It is one thing to be making a recon sweep through the main body of the complex, especially with the prospect of an orc or two too big but quite another to be trespassing on the most hollowed ground. And us, I added cheerfully, raising a few nervous smiles in response. Then let's get in there and get on with it, Nagot said, looking a great deal happier. Quite, I said, but then the glance at my chronograph, we only had a handful of minutes remaining before the short end of Isambard's estimate expired and I wanted to be in control chapel well before it did. I have to confess that finding our slow progress to this point irksome and extreme, but under the circumstances proceeding with caution had been only a sensible option, and now was hardly the time to abandon it. The enemy we failed to contact on the way in would almost certainly be in or around our objective. I could think of no other reason for them not to have engaged us in combat before now. We edged our way wearily inside, me hanging back as much as I decently could, and looked around, orienting ourselves. I had visited the inner sanctums of the Mechanicus shrines on several occasions before now, almost invariably in equal reluctance, so I had some idea what to expect. The burnished metal surfaces of control lecterns reflecting the lights and dials, which were supposed to tell their operators Emperor alone knew what, were all in place. But instead of gleaming steel or brass walls, embrossed with the sacred cogwheel I'd expected, the chamber was bounded with naked rock, which had been hewn from the high ceiling cavern and into which the devotional icons of tech priests had been duly chiseled. I got grimaced. Who let that one rip? She asked, with a pointed glance in Jürgen's direction. The inner sanctum connects directly into the volcanic vents, they told her. Jürgen sniffed the sulfur-reeking air. Smells like hell's edge, he said. And I nodded, reminded all too strongly of the sediments beside the magma lake on Permidia, and the unpleasant surprise which had awaited us there. Secure the station, Griffin ordered, and the troopers fanned out one team to reach each end of the tunnel mouths, leading off in the opposite sides of the chamber. Good idea, I agreed, shoving the door closed behind us. It was a lot of complex we hadn't covered on our way in, and the last thing we needed was to be taken by surprise by an orc or two sneaking up on us while we were engrossed in carrying Is out Isambard's instructions. The thin slab of metal wouldn't delay them for much more than a couple of seconds, but the noise they made forcing it open would still be a warning we needed. Jürgen, keep the exit covered. Very good, sir, he replied, dragging a chair from behind and the nearest lecterns. He subsided into it, his melter aimed squarely at the door, resting comfortably on his top of the abandoned control station. I handed him a data slate after paging down the direction that the tech priest had given me. I'll need both hands for this, I told him, looking around at the 
instrumentation surrounding us. There were a lot of flashing lights and flickering dials, rather too many of them red or with the needles bouncing back and forth against the stops. For my liking. Where do I start? Three lecterns on the dais. It says here, Jürgen told me, his forehead furring. What's a dais? This is. I mounted the circular platform around the circumference of which three lecterns were equidistantly spaced so that the operators would be facing outwards across the room. They all remained at their exact post. A single-minded dedication had been taken by surprise at exactly the same time, judging by the amount of blood which had been spilled here. I moved near and gingerly to the soles of my boots, adhering unpleasantly to the still sticky floor. The one facing the door should have a dial on it, my head continued, saying, Flow chamber pressure. Is the needle anywhere near the red bit? I looked down at the dial in question. If there's any deeper into it, I said, it would be about to go around again. The indicator was hard against the stop at the limit of its display, and I didn't need a tech priest to tell me what things were looking grim. What buttons do I press? None of them, Jürgen said. It says here you need to you need the emergency pressure vent or the pumps themselves down the left hand corridor. Left as I'm facing or as I came in, I asked, already now on the move. As you were facing, Jürgen said, in abruptly reversed direction, heading for the opposite tunnel mouth. He rose to his feet and I sprinted past. Should I come too? he asked, and I shook my head. Keep covering our backs. I told him, glancing back as I did so. If this doesn't work, we'll have to get out of here fast, and if we don't want any green skins getting in the way. He was already out of sight by the time I finished. But our calm beads relayed the rest of my words, comfortably enough. Despite the urgency of my errand, I found my pace slowing as I entered the chamber, unable to prevent myself from glancing around in awestruck astonishment. I was in a huge Nardwell's cavern. The walls fizzed and cracked, many of them leaking foul-smelling vapors. No doubt the removal of scents and smell was high on the list of augment enhancements for tech priests who worked here. In the center of it, the pumps rose, three or four times the height of a man. Pipes a meter or more in diameter were driven deep into the rock beneath my feet or cutting horizontally across the cavern to disappear into the wall. Several on them pointed in the direction of the turbine hall we had seen on our way in, where others presumably carried the water from wherever it was collected, ready to be forced down into the bowels of the plant. Commissar! Sergeant Griffin waved to me from beneath the shadow of the nearest pumps. I think you should see this. So long as it's quick, I said actually aware of every tick of the clock. But Griffin was a veteran, and as consistent of danger as I was. She wouldn't divert my attention at so critical a juncture without excellent reason. We found the bodies, she said, sounding oddly uncertain. Bits of them anyways, I think. As I rounded the huge metal tree trunk, I could see the reason for her reluctance. A tangle of blood-slick metal and glass was piled up against the cavern wall, glittering eerily in the light from the overhead luminators. Junai recognized them, Voorhees said, with a glance at Dire, who nodded. Augment it, believe me, I know. The Manicagano lungs punctuated her words with even hiss, click. Looks like someone ripped them clean out of their cogboys. Or spat them out, I said in a particular crawling sensation moving up and down my spine that the memories of Hell's Edge grew more vivid. The very notion was ridiculous, but I've seen something almost identical then, and once planted, the thought refused to go away. Keep away from the fizzers. Kamaza? Griffin looked at me quizzically, no doubt wondering if I had taken leave of my senses. The fissures. I gestured to the cracks on the surface of the rock. 
The mound of grisly trophies was right beneath. The largest, which certainly looked big enough to take a human cadaver, especially if it had been filtered of its non-organic components first. Have you pulled the lever yet, sir? Jürgen Vox. Just about to. Recalled to the matter of the moment, I turned back to the bulkiest of the medical structures. As in but had insert me, a large control lectern was set into it, almost completely obstructed by the number of prayer slips and wax seals inheriting to its surface. Before I had taken more than a couple strides, however, my attention was arrested by a faint echo of movement, almost inaudible over the steady rumbling of the mechanisms around us and the chugging of the pumps. I froze, listening intently, half convinced I imagined it. Then I heard it again, an unmistakable scuttling. Pull back, I called, gesturing wildly. Get away from the walls! Clearly still puzzled, Griffin and her trooper scurried to comply. She, Voorhees, and Dereri, no doubt remembering our expedition through the amble tunnels beneath Samilia Asilide, all too vividly. One of the troopers with them, a recent replacement, we picked up on Coronis, was a little slower, and he has gun down the dark cleft in the rock beside him, from what he undoubtedly imagined was a safe distance. I can hear... He began before his voice choked off in a panic-stricken scream as something dark and fast with too many limbs erupted from the fissure. He managed to get off about mm, two or three shots before going down, torn to shreds and a flurry of blows from the creature's razor-edged talons. What's going on? Jürgen Vox urgently, alerted by the noise. Are the orcs attacking? There never were any orcs, I shouted as the forearm monstrosity rose from the corpse of the eviscerated trooper, absently licking its blood from the face with a tongue that seemed far too long to stir sympathously in our direction. The place is swarming with tyranids. Chapter 13 Tyranids! Jürgen echoed, taking the news as phlegmatically as he always did. No one told us about them. The scuttling noise was all around us now, even as Gaunt launched itself at me. With its powerful hind legs, more of the creatures began to emerge from the rents in the rock. Pull back, I yelled, clipping at it with a round from my last pistol, but the hideous creature barely slowed its slavering maw gaping at me as it bounded in my direction with single-minded ferocity. The troopers opened up with their last guns, dropping several of the newcomers, but the swarm had been well and truly roused by now. And for every one that had fell, another came skittering out of the shadows with murderous intent, while reinforcement continued to pour through the clefts and walls as though the rock itself was sweating tyranids. I parried the first slash of the oncoming gaunt slating taws with my chainsword, biting deep into the sitting armor thorax, and shot it through the brain as it opened its maw to either scream in defiance or attempt to bite my face off. Can you still get the lever? Jürgen asked, ever mindful of our mission. I looked again at the largest pump with its prominent control lectern. A dozen gaunts were bounding across the intervening space, and more in the moment flickered in the shadows at the base of the great metal column, almost as if they were guarding it. Not a chance, I told them, as a volley of lasgun fire took out the three leading nids, just as began angling to cut us off from the tunnel we'd entered by. I'd be torn to pieces before I'd even get halfway to the controls, let alone begin to interact into rituals required to override whatever instructions the machine spirits within them currently needed. I put a last through the thorax of another gaunt, which had hurled itself at me in the wake of the fist, and turned back into the tunnel. Team two, coming to assist, Maggot Vox, to my heartfelt relief. Stay in the control chapel and be ready to cover us, 
Griffin responded. We're coming in with a swarm at our asses. And get that Valkyrie back on the ground, I Vox the pilot. If we managed to make it as far as the surface, I didn't want to go up to the power plant just because our ride was late. We'll be waiting, the pilot promised, with a ramp down. Then my attention was completely taken up by the urgent matter of survival. The creatures clustered around the pumps and raged weapon system biotes fused to their forelimbs. The sinister hissed as the discharge was almost lost in the general cacophony. Take out the gunners, I bellowed. The close combat bioforms were only a danger if they got within reach of us, but the living ammunition of the flesh borers would devour us alive from the inside out if the bearers managed to get off a lucky shot. Fortunately for us, the superior range of the troopers' las guns kept the nid gunners too far distant for accurate shooting. The deadly hail of tiny beetles they spat in our direction, either falling short or going wide. But they still came, closing the distance every time we were forced to switch our aim to pick off a uh, charging homergaunt. We can't hold them off for long, Boris commanded, firing a, few, uh, shoot. firing a few short bursts in an attempt to conserve ammunition. But with each we knew would drain the power pack frighteningly fast in any case. They don't try. Then don't try, I urged, already running for the panel tunnel math. We need to stay ahead of them. Lacking the powerful hind legs of the compatriots, which were bared, bred by the hive mind to get into close combat as fast as possible, the Tomregons would be easily enough to outpace, or at least keep from getting into flesh border range too quickly. I squeezed off a couple of shots at the outflanking Homergons, which was using a superior speed to try and cut us off from the tunnel we had entered. But the last bolts ricocheted harmlessly from the exoskeleton. Already committed to the attack, I ducked under the strike from its scything claws, felt the talon of one of the middle limbs catch for a moment in the fabric of my greatcoat, and rammed the tip of my chainsword up under its chin, tearing through the throat and skull alike as I struggled to free the blade. A goat of vile-smelling ecuor stroked my sleeve, and then I was clear, hurdling the carcass of another of the vile creatures, which had just been brought down by lasgun fire of one of my companions. Grenades! Griffin called as he broke through the tightening noose to gain the dubious sanctuary of the tunnel. Good plan, I agreed, turning to lose a couple of pistol shots at whatever was directly behind us. And finding that the entire width of the passageway was choked with bounding predators, I hit one a leg purely by luck and it stumbled, impeding loose behind it, which reacted by recovering the obstruction in the most straightforward manner possible, slashing it to pieces in an instant. The only positive thing I could see in the situation was that the least the gaunts above to tear us apart were blocking the fire of their weaker broodmates with the ranged weapons. Griffin yanked a frag grenade out of beneath her coat and lobbed it over her shoulder without breaking stride. The troopers did the same, and although it was probably my imagination, I could swear I had a clatter of the canisters hitting the rock crate over the scuttling and hissing of the brood behind us. Then the onrushing tide of sinister death rolled over them, just as it began to convince myself that the fuses had been too long. My shoulder blades tensed in anticipation of a bone-shattering blow from the behind. A quartet of overlapping explosions shook the corridor, jarring the floor beneath my feet. Unable to resist, glancing back, I saw the pursuing swarm had all but vanished, and the walls and ceiling decorated with shreds of glass and goats of echo. But before I had a chance to take in any more, the second wave surged into the passageway, flowing towards us with undiminished purpose. Once again, the flesh burrows hissed, and a clump of deadly beetles they used as ammunition hit the floor a meter from where I was standing. The tiny creatures scurried around frantically for a second or two in search of a host to burrow into, then mercifully expired. Termogonson coming, 
I voxed, then turned and sprinted to the relative sanctuary of the control chapel. We're ready for him, Maggot assured me. To my exponential relief, then we are clear of the tunnel, flinging ourselves aside to allow our companions a clear shot. The results were devastating. Maggot had flicked her lasga into full auto, and the troopers under her command had either followed her lead or been instructed to do so. A hail of fire skewered the tunnel, supplemented by a blast or two from Jürgen's melter for good measure. When the noise ceased, the passageway resembled nothing so much as a butcher's slab. The deadly organisms which had pursued us so reluctantly ripped apart by merciless barrage as effectively as they threatened to do so to us. That's seen him off, Maggot said, with a fair dose of optimism. Considering she'd seen for herself just how implacable the Tyranids could be during their abortive inversion of Permitidia. I'm going to call it different names every single time. I wouldn't count on it then, I cautioned. And sure enough, the unmistakable skittering sound of claws in the rock were already forcing their way through the dang echoes of Margot's massacre. They'll come after us again as soon as they realize we're not defeating defending the choke point. Then let's not hang around here till they work us out, Griffin said, a statement I hardly agreed with. Why didn't they attack us as soon as we arrived? Jürgen asked, falling into place at my shoulder, his melter reassuringly ready for use. They had taken us completely by surprise. I don't think they realized we were here, I said. They already killed everyone in the shrine, that much was given, a swarm the size of one we just encountered would have secured the place before anyone had time to react. Jürgen nodded. So they were sleeping it off when we arrived, he said, his brow furrowed with the effort of joining the dots. Essentially, I agreed, although some of the details of what we'd found continued to nag at me. It made sense that the swarm would make for the deepest part of the complex to digest its meal. The instinctive behavior of the organisms would ensure that. But how had they may of them creatures got inside into the first place? The main entrance had definitely been sealed when we arrived. At least we don't have to worry about tripping any greenskins booby traps on the way out, Griffin commented as we double-timed our way back towards the pad. That's something, I agreed, straining my ears for a scabbing of talons against the rockweed floor behind us. I was just beginning to hope against all reason that the experience of the hideous creatures, that we succeeded in intimidating them so thoroughly that they'd given up in the pursuit, when faintly at first, almost drowned by the clattering of our boot soles, I heard it. What is it? Griffin asked, seeing me tilt my head in the attempt to isolate the inclusive echo. They're coming, I said, behind us. No sooner were the words out of my mouth than an agonized scream echoed down the corridor. Our point woman was down, a massive hole chewed through her torso by a flesh better shot. As she failed on the grabby rock crate, Innumerable tiny parasites continued to writhe inside her hideous wound, enlarging it and burying even deeper in an attempt to feed on the luckiest swaddles' vital organs. And ahead, Maggot said, pausing only a grunt of the Emperor's pace, to hear unfortunate subordinate who was clearly beyond all hope of medica aid. How do they get ahead of us? I asked, opening fire on the small knot of gaunts which had appeared round to bend the corridor. Then my own question was answered by the sight of an air vent further down the corridor, its metal mesh cover ripped and shredded by powerful claws. If they got into the utility conduits, they could be anywhere. A storm of lasgon fire followed my lead, reaping bloody revenge for our loss. The leading tyranid lost its weapon and a large chunk of its carapace to Jürgen's melter. But the survivors regrouped almost at once, bolstered by another group of new arrivals. I glanced back down the corridor behind us, seeing a flicker of movement in the distance, which could only be the main bulk of the swarm in hot pursuit. We're blocked in, I told Griffin, 
hoping I didn't sound as panicky as I felt. We need another way out. Spotting a door on the wall, a couple of meters away, I flung it open, finding a small workshop behind it, which, judging by the scattering of tools, lubricants, and lumps of flesh, floating in jars of some foul-smelling liquid, had probably been used to repair the maintenance servitors. As refuge went, it wasn't much, but everyone piled in after me gratefully enough and began to barricade the door. A final glance before we slammed it was enough to underline the seriousness of our predicament. The nids were closing in for the kill from both directions, blocking the corridor ahead and behind. Attempting to force our way through either group would be suicidal. Jürgen glanced up from the data slate I'd given him to hold what felt like a lifetime ago. The nearest parallel corridor is that way, sir. He indicated the direction with a grubby thumb. Though eight meters of rock. Never an amble around when you need one, Ditter remarked, a feeble jest raising flickering smiles from those of us who'd encountered the creatures on Similar Oshirate, and remember the remarkable tunneling ability. I'd settle for a flamer or two, I got said. Well, we've got what we'd got, I replied looking around the workshop for anything which looked potentially combustible, explosive, or at least sharp. And finding little of any immediate apparent value, most of the tools looked as though they'd be equally at home in a Medicaid facility. And I was to loathe to, any, to try advocating any of the pieces of equipment racked around the walls. The machine shops resisting in them might wake up as cranky as I generally did and there was no telling what they were supposed to do anyway. Let's get that bench ridged against the door. We manhandled it into position, finding it certainly heavy and not before time. Almost as soon as we got into position, the scrabbling of talons against the thin sheet of metal started echoing around the room. Gene stealers would have torn through it like Jürgen with sandwich wrap. But fortunately for us, the scything claws of the gaunts were meant for close combat and little else. That won't hold them for long, Griffin said, ripping the power cable from one of the storage devices and jamming the bare ends against the metal door. There was a fizzle of sparks and an eerie illusion from the corridor, and the lights went out. After a moment of silence, the scrabbling began again, its enthusiasm undiminished. With a try. I said encouragingly, and so on except Jürgen, and I snapped on the illuminators and began attaching the bayonets to the barrels of the lasguns. A moment later, the lights flickered back on, a little dimmer than before. The preceding machine spit of the complex apparently continuing to take an interest in our welfare after all. How close are we to the surface? Pretty close, Jürgen told me, after a moment's hesitation, while he worked it out. He pointed at the ceiling. I think we must be under one of the shuttle refueling points. Let me see that, I asked, taking the slate. If I was reading it correctly, the pump control chamber was only a ceiling's thickness above our heads. Using the melter so close to a fuel tank the size of a swimming pool would be an immense risk. But if we stayed where we were, we'd be vaporized anyway. The only moot question was whether we end up as tuning in it in digestion first. Or just a blank smear on the wall. I pointed upwards at the whitewashed ceiling. If you wouldn't mind. Of course not, sir. My aide replied, aiming the melter upwards and pulling the trigger. Where the rest of our party took cover beneath the workbenches... The authentic glare I'd become so familiar with since he'd acquired his favorite toy punched through my tightly closed eyelids. The backwash of heat singed the hair in my nostrils, and charred debris clattered and pinged off the gleaming metal surfaces above our heads. Almost there! He fired again and coughed in evident satisfaction. That ought to do it. Indeed it should. I agreed, looking up at the hole above our heads. The edges were still almost molten, but cooling fast. Heistened by the blast of frigid air with 
which could be coming from the surface. The Valhallans looked at one another, visibly cheered by the chill, then turned to the door as something large and heavy rammed into it from the other side. The workbench quivered. Time we were leaving, I think. Despite the cooling effect of the breeze from the surface, the edges of the hole were almost too hot to touch. But that was the least of my worries. If we didn't move fast, we were going to get a great deal hotter before long, and no one hesitated before jumping off from the much-abused benches. Trusting to our gloves and heavy greatcoats to keep us from burning as we swarmed up through the hole, we found ourselves in a high ceiling chamber, most of which was taken up with a peculiar assemblage of piping, connected to a hose of thickness by my, of my arm, which disappeared through a hole in the opposite wall. The whole contraption was mounted on a hydraulic platform, clearly intended to raise it to the level of its surface. After a moment, I identified a faint, waning sound as engines of our Valkyrie, muffled by a layer of rockcrete, still sealing us in, and exhaled with relief. The pilot, it seemed, had been good on his word. Target the main entrance, I voxed him. Nightmare visions of being outflanked by Nids again, rising up to plague me. And take out anything that moves. Sir? The pilot sounded confused, and I couldn't say I blamed him. Will that put you and your squad in the firing line? We're leaving another way, I told them. Clambering into the platform, a small control lectern stood near the welded metal scripts, and I studied the controls as Jürgen and the others scrambled up behind me, crowding the narrow operating station far more than its builders had envisioned. Its most prominent feature was a large red button, so I prodded it, hopefully for a moment. Nothing seemed to happen. Then, with a loud clunk, a narrow band of daylight appeared above our heads, followed almost at once by a pattering of disturbed snow cover falling through the gap. As it continued to widen, the wind reached in, with a, uh, reached in to claw through my coat, and even a few of the Valhallin refasted theirs. We're rising! Dere shouted as the platform beneath our feet shuddered into motion and began cranking itself up towards the surface. And not before time, I added, spotting a flicker of movement through the still streaming hole in the floor. The nids had finally succeeded in forcing the door of the workshop. A moment later, the first termagant scrambled up through it, raising its flesh borer as it came. Before it could fire, a volley of lasgun rounds tore it to pieces, but within seconds, the riddled corpse had been shoved aside by another, and another after the newcomer met by the same fate. Where a third could fire, the raising platform reached the surface, sealing our pursuers in a rock crate tomb. The weapons could never penetrate a flurry of snowflakes battered into my face. Driven with even more force than usual by the backwash of the engines of the Valkyrie, hovering just above the pad. I sprinted for its boarding ramp, my eyes narrowed against the blizzard, which seemed to be blowing with undiminished enthusiasm. We've got a moment by the bunker. The pilot voxed, and I turned to look, a sudden flare of panic urging me to get even greater speed. A swarm of close combat organisms was boiling from the surface, their distinctive long curved claws marking them out as homergants and I cursed my earlier division to leave it open for a quick evacuation. Although, to be fair, I could hardly have foreseen the situation we now found ourselves in. I cracked off a couple of last pistol shots, although I accidentally hit any of the fast-moving targets thrown by the obscuring snow as much as extreme range. I have no idea. I'm trying to gauge if they'd taken the hovering Valkyrie before we did, so far as I could tell, it looked like being a dead heat, which would still be bad news for us, as we'd never be able to scramble aboard if we were too busy fighting for our lives. Then the pilot vectored his jets, shooting straight backwards, the open ramp raising its constellation of sparks as it skittered towards us across the pad. In! I yelled, leaping aboard, just before the thick metal plate plowed through my ankles. 
The forward-mounted multi-laser triggered, sizing through the onrushing nids with a sound like sky being ripped in two, and I found myself gaping in astonishment at the pilot's odyssey. Nice flying! Need to open the range to hit. He responded. Everyone aboard! All accounted for, Griffin assured me. I smacked the closing mechanism with the butt of my chainsaw, reluctant to let go of either weapons. I held until they were convinced we were safe. Go! I told the pilot, and was immediately obliged to grab hold of the nearest sanctum to prevent myself from being pitched straight back out of the closing hatch. As he put the nose up and kicked the main engines, the maximum thrust. With the aid of Jürgen's outstretched hand, I hauled myself over to the nearest viewport, looking down at the rapidly shrinking huddle of buildings below. I strained my eyes for any further signs of the swarm, but if there was any movement on the surface other than the wind-blown snow, the blizzard was obstructed. Abruptly, without warning, the aircraft shook, buffled by a shock wave which threatened to tear it apart from the sky. A dense column of smoke and ash burst from where the mechanicus shrine had stood an instant before, to be followed almost at once by a geyser of bright orange magma. Its vivid color even more shocking against the monochrome landscape. We lurched our engine, faltering at the dust from the explosion, was sucked into the turbines, then began to claw our way back to the sky as the pilot brought us round upwind of the livid wound in the planet's crust. I breathed a sigh of relief and settled into my seat as our course steadied. The presence of the Tyranids had been an unpleasant surprise, to say the least, but no doubt we'd be get to the bottom of their sudden appearance soon enough. In the meantime, there was still the orcs to be taken care of. Come, Azar, Castine said, her voice unexpectedly cutting into my calm beat. Can you confirm the Terranid infestation at Objective 2? We can, I said. Termagants and Harmagants are for certain. There were any other bioforms present. We didn't account for them. I took another look at the ash plume, diminishing in the distance. Luckily, there only seemed to be a small nest, and the explosion should have taken care of them nicely. I wouldn't count on that, Castine said, her voice grim. We lost contact with Kamaza Forres and the platoon she took in with her at the Objective 1. Are Lustig's people around yet? I asked, remembering the contingency plans we discussed before we set out on this unexpectedly perilous reconnaissance sweep. They are. Castine said. But you're closer, and Objective One's infested as well. They'll need all the recon data we can give them. I agreed, even though I was outside the chain of command. She could still ask for my assistance, and I was in no position to refuse it. My standing with the common troopers would be cut off at the knees if I let the entire platoon walk into the maw of a tyrannous swarm blind. I sighed, and tried not to grit my teeth. Diverting to assist, I told her. Vox the coordinates to the pilot. Ooh. Tyranids. Wasn't expecting that. Anyways, let's say thank you to our ongoing Patreon supporter, Mr. Cussman123. And thank you for joining me for another chapter of Kyphus Kane. This is a shorter one because of um, the past incident that is going on. And I'm also going to be um, reading more books, hopefully sometime soon. So we'll be seeing more stories and things pop up on the channel. A lot more stuff to watch and listen to. Different stories to jump from here and to, if you wish. Or just wait till a certain amount of chapters are out before jumping in. The playlists are going to be set up on my channel. I have multiple playlists there. If you want to check them out, go for it. And if you want to be a Patreon supporter so I can say your name at the end of the video, you can in the link down below in the description. If you like the channel, subscribe. If you like the video, leave a like. If you want to leave a comment, leave a comment saying whatever's on your mind about the story. Because it always helps to help the channel. Anyways, I've been me, you've been you, and I'll be seeing you in the next video coming out sometime soon. 
Until then, be safe out there and have a good one. Bye-bye.